This is why the media claims property prices will crash. The base rate we've just heard from the Bank of England has been increased. Costs are, have risen hugely. The highest level of repayments. Higher rates, more difficult affordability checks, and possible house prices coming down. The highest rates since a period when the UK was about to face the biggest housing crash it ever faced before. I'm worried there's a ticking time bomb on mortgages. But in reality, the data from Bloomberg shows that only 30% of households actually have mortgages. And those who do have mortgages, top fifth of the UK income earners, so the richest, account for almost half the outstanding mortgages who are better placed to withstand rate rises. So I started looking at the data from the Bank of England, the Office of National Statistics, and property websites like Zooplay to find out if property prices will actually crash or is this just media scaremongering? You know, the sensible money is that house prices are going to start to drop. I am positive that real estate is not going to go down in value in the next five years. James asks, is this likely to cause the housing market to crash? Well, it's crystal ball time, isn't it? First, let's go through three reasons why property prices could collapse. And the first one is residential mortgages. The big news recently has been that interest rates could potentially go up to 6%. Then came the mini budgets. That went up to a peak of 6.1%. So as a result of that, a lack of housing supply won't help one iota when mortgage rates are somewhere between 5 to 7%. But let's work out the impact on mortgages if rates do go up to 6%. Let's say you have a mortgage on the order of 250,000 pounds, 25 years, and it's a repayment mortgage. Typically, you can get about a 2% rate. And you've been able to get a 2% rate for the last few years. So that means your mortgage would be just over £1,000. If this was to jump up to 6%, then this goes to £1,611, which is an increase of £600, which is pretty substantial. But over the course of the year, that's £7,200. There's a chart by the BBC, which explains the impact based on how big your mortgage is. So for example, let's say you have a loan of £200,000 or £400,000. So at 2%, you're paying £848. At 4%, that jumps up to £1,055. And at 6%, it jumps up to £1,289. And you can see this for mortgages ranging from £100,000 all the way to £400,000. And so the media are essentially claiming that, well, if someone's mortgage payments is going up to £441. Let's say a lot of people are not in a position to actually afford the £441. People will start to default on their mortgages. The banks would eventually repossess their house or what they would have to do is they would have to sell the property, get rid of it, and that will lead to a huge supply of properties in the market and that would essentially crash the prices. The second reason is sharp jump in interest charges for those refinancing will hit profits. So let me give you an example. Currently, I've got a bachelor property, which is a house we turned into two flats last year. And so the price of each flat is £25,000. I've got a 75% mortgage on that property, which comes to £187,500. And the current rent for that property is around £1,000. If I go back on the mortgage interest calculator and I put in my mortgage debt of £187,500, 25 years interest only, my mortgage on that is 3%. So the mortgage is 469. My profit is essentially this area here. Of course, there's other costs that I'm not really counting for that with this example. So £469. What happens is if this rate then jumps up to 6%, that goes up all the way to £938. £938. This was my profit before. My profit is this, is this tiny section right at the top. So they're just this tiny bit here. And for a lot of people, they might not even be making a profit depending on how big the mortgage is and the rentals in the area. And so once again, the argument is that if a lot of people are in this position where because their cost has gone up by so much because of mortgage interest rates, then what's gonna happen is those people are gonna start selling those properties. There's gonna be a ton of properties in the market once again. So residential people are selling, bachelor landlords are selling. So there's a ton of properties in the market. And at the same time, demand is exactly the same. And so therefore, property prices in theory should go down. This is the third reason, which is all to do with the demand. If you go on Google and Google mortgage interest calculator and click maximum loan, on a monthly payments, this is how much you can contribute towards your mortgage every month. So let's say you are trying to buy a residential house. You work out that you can put 1,000 pounds every month towards the mortgage and so when the rates are at two you can borrow 235,950 pounds so you put a deposit down of 10 percent 20 percent whatever that is but the bank will give you 235,000 pounds what happens is if that rate then goes up to six percent suddenly this number has gone down to 155,207 which is a pretty big drop because what's happening is because it's, co it's costing so much more to borrow money that 1,000 pound a month doesn't get you as far as it would have when interest rates were much lower so from a demand point of view you have all these properties and people who would previously able to afford them they're no longer to afford them because the bank's not going to lend them the money and so therefore what's going to happen is demand's also going to go down at the same time because people can no longer buy those properties since that world is unaffordable people are going to be selling their homes because they can't make their mortgage payments landlords are going to be selling their properties because well it's no longer profitable 
And then at the same time, the demand's gonna go down as well because people can't borrow enough money in order to buy these properties. So when you take those three together, that leads to a huge price collapse potentially because there's more properties on the market and no one's buying. So naturally prices would come down. Let's look at data why potentially prices don't collapse. And so obviously the big reason for them collapsing is the fact that interest rates have gone up. But if you look at this data from Bloomberg, only 30% of households actually have outstanding mortgages. The other 70% splits almost equally between those who own outright, i.e. have no mortgage and those who rent. And then he goes on to say, according to French, the top fifth of the UK income earners account for almost half of the outstanding mortgages, which means they should be better placed to withstand rate rises. If you go on this data from the Office of National Statistics, this gives you a breakdown of all the properties in this country. The owners say, that there's 24.7 million properties in this country, 8.8 .8 million of them have no mortgages. So if you have no mortgages, interest rates aren't really going to affect you at all. So these properties don't really matter in this equation, but they don't have a mortgage, they have no impact. 6.8 million properties do have a mortgage, and so these are households who have mortgages. 4.8 million people are renting, so again, these people don't have mortgages, the people living in the property don't have mortgages. Of course, the landlord still potentially has a mortgage, but the people living there don't. 4.2 million is social housing owned by the council. I have no idea if this has a mortgage or if it doesn't and how that particularly works. But so out of the 24.7 million, really the subset that we're looking at is this subset here, which is people living in their own house who have a mortgage and landlords who have mortgages on their rental properties. This website called ukfinance.org.uk shows this data here. Who might actually be affected by the changes in interest rates? So this chart too shows the proportion of new homeowners mortgages taken on a fixed rate. So if you look from around 2014, 90% of mortgages have been on a fixed rate. You can either get a two year fix or a five year fix. So when you get a mortgage, your interest rate is fixed for the next two years or the next five years. It doesn't matter what happens in the economy or what the rates go up to. You're not gonna pay more than the rate you locked in for two to five years. And so 90% of people, and that, that number jumps up even more to around 95% in 2018, to fixed mortgages. For most mortgage borrowers, the change in the bank rate will have no effect on their mortgage rates in the short term. Currently, 74% of homeowner mortgages are on a fixed contract with 96% of new borrowers choosing this option since 2019. So therefore, a sizable majority of borrowers will see no immediate increase in their monthly repayments. So out of the 6.8 million people, it's only really gonna impact two types of mortgage holders. One who are on variable rates, what that means is that your mortgage is not fixed, so when interest rate changes, your mortgage also changes. The data from the Bank of England says approximately 850,000 mortgage borrowers have a tracker rate mortgage currently. So out of the 6.8 million people with mortgages, 850 of them are on tracker mortgages. So when interest rates do go up, then they also have an impact. And so if you go on this article by the Financial Times, it then goes on to say more than 2 million households will have to remortgage at higher rates in the next two years. So if you look at the quarter Q1 2013, so the first quarter of 2013, 350,000 people will have to remortgage. This chart essentially is the number of mortgages reaching the end of the fixed term period, which means that if you're on a two year fix or a five year fix, that term is going to be ending in the first quarter of 2013. That's ending for 350,000 people. And it says 2 million people will have to remortgage at the high rates over the next two years. But if we look at it over like the next one year, because obviously right now we're seeing a lot of volatility in the market and we don't necessarily know where rates are going to be over the two years. It might have come down by then because the economy might be a lot more stable. But let's work out who does this actually impact in the short term. And in the short term, if we look at a one year span, you can probably say it's around like 1 million people, right? We're here in just in the last quarter of 2022. If you look at the next four quarters, it's around 350,000 every quarter. So four quarters, that's 1.4 million people. So 1.4 million people are essentially on fixed mortgages, which are going to end. So when the rates do go up, then those people will also face the burden of those increased mortgages. So out of the 6.8 million people, 850,000 are affected because they're on variable and 1.4 million are affected because they're on fixed rates, which are going to end. So that's about two and a half million out of the 6.8. The same article by the Financial Times, which that the buy-to-land landlords are under strain for mortgage rises, it then goes on to say, of the 1.3 million buy-to-land mortgages on a fixed rate in June 2022, about 220,000 were set to mature over the 12 months to June 2013. So out of the 4.8 million, we don't really have data on how many of these have mortgages and how many of these don't have mortgages. There were 1.3 million buy-to-land mortgages which were on a fixed rate. And of those, only 220,000 are actually set to mature over the next 12 months. So only 220,000 of those are really affected, plus those who are on variable mortgages. But again, I don't have the data for that. So for example, in 2019, I bought a few one-bedroom flats, which I turn into two bedroom flats and they're all in five year fixed mortgages. The fixed term mortgage on those will end towards the end of 2014, which is about two years away. So even though interest rates are going up right now, I'm not impacted until two years time. And most people would hope that the economy has stabilized significantly. And so the interest rates probably will not be at six, 7% or whatever they're claiming, they'll probably start to come back down again. So if I go back in the calculator, we have 850,000 people who are on variable mortgages. 
We have 1.4 million people who are on fixed mortgages, which are going to end. And we have another 220,000 coming on because of landlords. The total number of people affected or properties affected is 2.47 million properties out of the 24.7. So that's actually only 10% of the properties in this country, which are actually impacted by the rate rises. So you could argue 10% is still a lot. That's 2.47 million properties. If all of them came onto the market at the same time, that would lead to a pretty big property crash. So a lot of people are drawing this parallel of what happened in 2008 with essentially what's happening right now. But there is one big difference. Since the financial crisis, UK mortgages have become less risky. This graph shows the loan to value of mortgages. If you have a £100,000 property and you have a 75 thousand pound loan that means you have a 75 percent loan to value and so the bigger the loan you have the more risky that mortgage is if you look at 2008 more than 50 percent of mortgages were more than 75 percent loan to value in 2008 back then one in seven mortgages were highly leveraged with a loan to value ratio equal to or greater than 90 percent so one to seven that's like 14 15 percent of mortgages in the years since then banks have turned the lending criteria with only four percent having the same borrowing level this is the main part today's borrowers must raise relatively large deposits and this is the key and demonstrate Demonstrate they can withstand interest rate rises. This is the big difference between what happened in 2008 and what's happening right now. If I go to the market right now and look for residential mortgage deals, and I'll just go to the money supermarket, I'm looking to buy. I'm looking to buy to live in. It doesn't really matter if you're a first-time buyer or not. I'm just viewing properties to check the best mortgage rates available, and I click next. So we have a five-year fixed mortgage by nationwide. Interest rate on that is 5.39%. So now if I go back to my mortgage interest calculator that we had earlier, and we said if we had a mortgage of 250,000 pounds, it was repayment, interest rate was 2%, then that comes to 1,060 pounds. If you go to the market, you're not getting 2%, you're getting 5.39%. And so it's not 1,060 pounds, it's, that's gonna go up to 1,520 pounds. So if I draw this out here, your mortgage payments have gone up from 1,060 to 1,520. And so the argument was that people can't afford 1,520 and therefore they're gonna to have to sell these properties, supply is gonna go up and the market's gonna tank. But like the article said, people have to demonstrate they can withstand interest rate rises. So after 2008, they introduced something called a stress test, which meant it didn't matter that when you bought the property, if the rates in the market were 3% or they were 5.39%, your mortgage application was stress tested at 5.5%. So unless you could demonstrate that you could still pay the mortgage, even if the rate was 5.5% interest rate, you will not be able to get that mortgage. And so therefore the affordability checks for those mortgages were much higher. So if I go back to the mortgage interest calculator and I put in 5.5%, which was a stress test, and I click calculate, in order to pass the stress test, your mortgage had to be this, that comes to 1,535 pounds. So 1,535 pounds. So when you got a mortgage, you essentially had to demonstrate that you could make the mortgage payments up till 1,535 pounds, which is a 5.5% interest rate. And so currently you can get rate which are less than 5.5%, you can get 5.39%, which is slightly less. In theory, the majority of the people should not be in a situation where they suddenly have to sell their properties and they have to default on their mortgages because they could only get the mortgage in the first place if they could actually show they can still make monthly payments of this much. Of course, a lot of people probably wouldn't have anticipated rates are going to go up, so they might have spent more money, they could have bought a car, they might not have the savings. People had to demonstrate they can pay this much. And so a lot of people would probably have to cut back on their spending, but they shouldn't be in a situation where they're going to lose their homes because they can no longer make the mortgage payments. So essentially, the people who have household mortgages, the 850,000 on variable and the 1.4 million people who have fixed mortgages, the vast majority of those people should still be able to afford their mortgages because of the stress test. We still have these 220,000 buy to their mortgages, whereby since the rates have gone up, and the landlords are no longer profitable and therefore they'll have to sell the property. If you look at this article by The Guardian, the average London rent hits 553 pounds a week because of property shortages. A state agent of Foxton says an average of 29 renters competed for each property in September. And so the managing director of Foxton's goes on to say, this demand was triggered by a huge number of new renters. And one of the reasons is that interest rate rises persuaded some buyers to continue renting in the immediate future. When interest rates go up, the people who are about to buy a property, they might be thinking, I don't really want to buy a property right now because my mortgage is going to be so much. I might wait a few years and then I'll buy a property down the line. And so suddenly you have all these extra people who are willing to rent rather than buy the properties. And you might even have some landlords selling their properties because they might be worried about profitability. So the supply has gone down slightly, but demand has massively increased. In May 2020, we had approximately five people competing for each property. May this year, that figure jumped to 35 people. Per so that is an increase by sevenfold. Demand has increased by seven times because people are not buying their properties, they're renting properties. And so naturally what's gonna happen is that's gonna drive the rents up. Sky News analysis shows there are a third fewer homes listed for rent than in 2019 with prices up 
by a fifth. In this situation here, you, where your profit margin was squeezed and because your rent was 1,000 and the mortgage had gone up, if the rents then start to go up by 10, 20% and it goes up to not 1,000, but 1,200, suddenly your profit margin had gone back up not to the same level as before, but it's not squeezed by so much that you're forced into selling your property because you can no longer make your mortgage payments. And so by to the landlords, including myself, I would not really want to be selling in this market anyway if there's uncertainty. And so if I can hold on to the property and benefit from capital appreciation in the long run, then I'm going to do my best to hold on to this rather than trying to sell this off. So again, out of the 220,000 bachelor landlords and fixed mortgages, it's very hard to say how many of those are actually going to be in a situation where they're forced to sell their property. And so supply is not suddenly going to increase massively and lead to a huge amount of properties in the market. The final reason for why property prices potentially are going to crash is the issue with demand. A lot of people are in a situation to buy properties because you can't get a loan which is big enough anymore because interest rates have gone up. Though this is true for residential mortgages, when it comes to buy to let mortgages, the impact actually isn't as significant because of how the lending criteria work. Even if interest rates go up, if you can show that this property can still be rented out and still be profitable, which in a lot of situations they can be depending on the area, even with a higher interest rate, you'll still end up passing the affordability calculations and therefore it's not really going to impact you that much when it comes to buying properties. So people who are buying buy to let properties, then from a demand point of view, it doesn't really impact you as significantly as it does for residential. So you don't necessarily have a situation from that point of view where demand is significantly dropped because if you're a buy to let landlord, you can still continue buying properties. Because you have a situation where the buy to land landlords might not be impacted that much, the only people who are really going to sell in this market are people who potentially maybe have a divorce, probate property. So if someone's passed away and they want to sell the property and pay off inheritance tax, they'll have to sell the properties and any other issues, people who are in a situation where they can't actually make the mortgage payments. But beyond that, if you can hold on to your property, then why would you sell the property? Plus, if someone's on a fixed rate mortgage and let's say you're looking to downsize or you're looking to upsize, then those people aren't going to sell their properties either because if they're currently on a fixed rate mortgage for the next two to five years, if they sell their property and buy a new property, they're going to have to pay a much higher interest rate on the new property. So people looking to downsize or upsize, they probably won't do that for the next few years either. And so because of that, it's going to lead to a lot less supply of properties on the market. But at the same time, people are going to be buying less properties as well because a lot of people are not getting residential mortgages and people might just be uncertain. 100% of real estate prices is based on supply demand, period. When there is more buyers than sellers, prices go up. When there is more sellers than buyers, prices go down. This data from Zoopla shows the market activity dropped sharply in the last week. So this is week of 9th of October. The buyer demand dropped by 21%. Number of house sales will actually slightly increase. New supply also dropped. Sales agreed also dropped. So of course, there is going to be some drop in activity because people are buying less properties. Another data from Zoopla shows the asking price reduction over its 5% spike higher. 4% of homes see price reduced for more than 5% since the mini budget. So it probably would be fair to argue that demand to some degree is going to fall and because of this fall in demand multiple forecasts now have now have average uk house prices falling more than 10 percent on a nominal basis over the next two years if you look at this chart here this is the average uk house price in july of 2020 that was 292,118. But thanks to the run-up in prices during the pandemic, even a fall that steep would only push the prices back to levels recorded in May 2021. Even if you drop the price by 10%, you end up being around this sort of mark here, which were the prices during the pandemic. So if you bought a property prior to the pandemic, then most likely you're not really going to be impacted that much. Last year, I bought a mixed-use building, which I'm currently turning into fourth less, then you will see some sort of an impact on your prices. But I don't think it's going to be as significant as people are making out to be, that all hell is going to break loose and the property market is going to crumble completely. And every person left, right, and center is going to be defaulting on their mortgages. You probably will see a slight decrease in price, but most likely it's not going to be significant enough to take you past where prices were in 2021. And so if you're looking to invest in property, as long as you take a long-term approach, then you should be fine. Because even if prices do go down slightly in the short term, eventually they will start to go back up. But if you take a very short-term approach and you say, I want to buy these properties to make passive income, then that might not necessarily be the best time. Because in the short term, when rates are higher, then your cash flow is going to take more of a hit. But as long as you stick to a long-term play where you hold the property for 10, 20 years, eventually that property will appreciate and you will make good cash flow in the long run. But you shouldn't rely too much on it in the short term.